In the summer of 2012, the City of London in England, in the UK, was the host of the Olympic Games. The, the London Games were very much structured around um, a recognition of and exploration of the diversity and multiculturalism of the City of London and in do, being so representative of the, the modern state of the United Kingdom. Um, two years on, um, we now see um, the uh, attention going away from the City of London uh, to the next host in uh, Rio in Brazil. Uh, and as a, perhaps as a warm up to that, the Brazil World Cup, uh, very much uh, again celebrating the diversity uh, of that country, the host country of Brazil, uh, a, a country um, which thrives uh, in a recognition and exploration of its own diversity, which is that diversity very much built in to its national identity. Unfortunately for the UK, um, the uh, image of the UK as being multicultural has been somewhat tarnished um, by the recent uh, national and European elections uh, held here in the UK, um, uh, local council elections and European parliamentary elections, saw the rise, um, what uh, some have described the political earthquake uh, of the success of the UK Independence Party, a party that is openly hostile to Europe's international role within the European Union as part of the European Union, which it's been part of for um, half a century, uh, and also um, anti-immigration and to a degree anti-multiculturalist. The rise of the UK Independence Party may be significant in the long term, or we may look back on this um, and wonder why so much concern was expressed uh, about this particular party. What I want to talk about in this class is more about the role of multiculturalism on a more historic level um, within the UK and particularly with reference uh, to the UK as an amalgamation of different countries, England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, uh, and these have lived together uh, in relative um, contentment with each other, relative contentment with each other for several hundred years. Uh, Later this year, in, on September the 18th, a referendum will be held in Scotland um, to give the people of Scotland a chance to decide whether they wish to remain as part of the United Kingdom or to leave the United Kingdom and Scotland to become an independent nation. Um, Scotland uh, is a distinct country with its own distinct culture and it is hard to know how that vote will go at present with various predictions being made either way. This is going to be fundamentally important, of course, to the development of the United Kingdom, because if Scotland do leave and if they vote yes, um, then Scotland will uh, uh, gain its independence in March 2016. The United Kingdom uh, will then consist only of the three countries of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And what, what that will mean for those countries is hard yet um, to, to, to fathom. Um, Scotland has been on a path towards independence uh, for many years. A vote was held in 1978, um, which rejected, marginally rejected, the idea of some form of devolution of power. Um, after uh, a further couple of decades, a, a second vote was held in 1997, on the, 9th of on the 11th of September 1997, in which um, a resounding yes was made to devolution, to uh, the passing of powers to a Scottish Parliament from the UK Parliament. Not all powers, this wasn't independence, but a, um, a, a, a more federal agreement between Scotland and the United Kingdom. Uh, which has been in place now uh, since, since that time. Uh, once that devolution took place, um, some may say it was inevitable that Scotland would gain independence. That's not so clear. Much, of course, depends on how the, Sc the people of Scotland uh, vote uh, in September this year. Um, what what it was inevitable was that Scotland's relationship with 
England and the United Kingdom would change through that devolution. There would be a development, but whether or not they stayed together in the same country or uh, uh, separated, um, uh, it, only history will be able to tell us uh, the answer to that uh, in, in good detail. One of the um, UK ministers at the time described the change that such devolution would bring about in terms of the old poem of Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and had a great fall, etc. And this minister, Michael Forsyth, said that once Humpty Dumpty was broken, you couldn't put him back together again. And this is an, uh, an interesting an analogy that once Scotland gained its devolution, gained its parliament, uh, that the UK would not be able to take back powers that it had devolved to Scotland. And uh, he was implying the possibility that, of course, that that break might be a formal break in terms of independence. Um, the, the, the issue of whether or not the break was a good thing is perhaps what's most important. For most Scots, the majority of Scots voting in 1997, they felt that this would be very good for the country. There was a resounding yes to devolution, and that may be carried forward into this year's vote in terms of independence. But the majority of Scots did not have the negative feeling that that minister had that something would be broken by the fall. Um, and the analogy can be perhaps made that if, if, if Humpty Dumpty was indeed an egg, um, then you do need to break eggs to make a good omelette, and therefore uh, that change did need to happen. Now, there's an analogy can be made that historically things change, countries change. Of course, if we go back far enough in history, we'll find that Scotland and England were two separate nations. They've had a long relationship, but they were once independent of each other. England was the um, the larger of the two and exerted its power quite considerably over Scotland over a number of years, as any person who's seen the, the film Braveheart with Mel Gibson um, will, will recall. Now, the historic, historicity of Braveheart is, you know, in, in terms of how accurate it is, it isn't the point, but it, it, it tells the beginning of a long story of the relationship between Scotland and England that finally led to the union of the crowns between the two countries, um, and then eventually the actual act uh, of uh, creating a single United Kingdom out of um, Scotland and England, as well as um, Wales and eventually Northern Ireland, uh, once uh, the rest of Ireland ceded uh, from that. Um, historically, things change. And in the UK, another important change has been the change of the makeup of the country. Viewers of the TV series Downton Abbey um, may get a picture of England in particular, where the uh, drama is based, Northern England, uh, as being quite ethnically homogenous. Uh, most of the people within the drama are white English, um, um, some Scots, but uh, mostly white British. Um, and that indeed was how Britain was to a large degree up until the midi middle of the 21st century. Uh, quite homogenous in terms of ethnicity, although quite diverse in terms of its regions and its classes and other aspects, and of course the diversity across the different countries between Scotland and England and so on. Despite that being the case in the mid-20th century, Things have changed very considerably since then. Up to the mid-20th century, Britain um, had a large empire stretched across the planet, uh, India, Africa, uh, and elsewhere. The um, mid-20th century saw the end of that empire to a large part, the, the loss of the colonies as the British saw it. But this was the gaining of independence the emergence of new independent countries, um, such as India, um, such as in Africa, Southeast Asia, uh, and elsewhere. What also happened in the mid-20th century was after the devastation of the global war of the Second World War, um, the need to rebuild the country and the economy 
um, produced huge uh, uh, demands, not only financially, but in terms of labour, which could not be met um, within the UK population. And from that time onwards, there was um, uh, uh, recurring cycles of labour shortages that required inward migration, immigration, from, of people from other countries in order to meet the needs of the economy uh, as it grew, as it lay stabilized and leveled off and then grew again. Um, these immigrants, these uh, labor migrants, um, initially came uh, from countries that, were, that had been former British colonies, such as um, in, the, uh, in, in the country, new, newly formed countries of South Asia, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, uh, Sri Lanka, the uh, countries of the Caribbean, um, uh, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and, and others, um, to, to, to do jobs that needed to be done in order for the economic recovery to, to uh, for the um, economic growth uh, to occur. Um, many of these migrants came temporarily, but stayed and settled and became British citizens and further growth happened and further migrations occurred uh, through the 60s, 70s, 80s onwards through uh, the century, sometimes out of necessity, such as when newly independent Uganda, uh, the um, uh, president of the time, Idi Amin, forced out uh, the Indians, the Asians uh, from Uganda, other times in the 1990s as a, as a result uh, of um, refugees from countries such as Afghanistan and from Iraq, from Somalia uh, and elsewhere, um, wave upon wave of new populations have come to the UK, um, given visas, given right to abode in, in most cases. Now, many people want to go back in history and try and rewrite that, um, and perhaps say we shouldn't have done that, the UK shouldn't have allowed them in. Um, whether there, there were rights or wrongs about the decisions that were made about granting of visas, um, that those migrations happened, and very often this resulted in the establishment of new British citizens uh, with different cultures, with um, not necessarily their own histories, but their family histories stretching across the globe uh, to countries in Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, South America, Southeast Asia, uh, and so on and so on. Many many different uh, people, making up a very diverse population of the UK uh, as we find it today. And that is an ongoing story. But for the large part, uh, as I said, we, we cannot go back to how it was in the 1950s and earlier. Um, part of the uh, attraction of um, dramas such as Downton Abbey is they tell a nostalgic story of how things used to be, not how they are. Um, of course, even at the time of Downton Abbey, Britain was very much a global player. It had its empire. It was interfering in other people's countries on a very large scale. Much of the wealth of the, of the UK, of England, that built houses such as Downton came from foreign investments. Uh, related to the um, empire, related uh, to British colonial control of other uh, other countries, their economies, uh, and so on. The the issue, uh, the important issue, is that like with the relationship between England and Scotland being changed by history, likewise the British population itself has been changed by history, and like Humpty Dumpty. Uh, could not be put back together again in terms of that Scottish-English relationship. If we want to go back and re redo the uh, homogenous nature, the unified ethnic nature of England or the UK, we just can't do that anymore. We can't send people home because in most cases we're talking of people whose home is here. The, um, the, the UK comedian Lenny Henry whose family originated uh, from the Caribbean, um, tell stories of how, um, told stories in the 1980s of how in the 1970s as a child he was told to go home and he got confused because his home was, the, was in the West Midlands in the black country. 
uh, uh, an area industrial or formerly industrial area of the West Midlands. That was his home. If he went, wanted to go home, that was where he went. But of course, the people who told him to go home uh, meant somewhere quite, di quite, quite different um, outside of the UK. Going home is staying here. Going home is we are all at home here. We are all multicultural. The UK is a multicultural society. It's a diverse country. Whether we call it multicultural or not, it's a country um, founded now on a history of diversity. There are various people um, of different backgrounds who are all stakeholders in the British national identity. And this needs to be recognised as an important part of what makes Britain today. So therefore, debates about British identity and about the policy uh, of British communities need to take this into account, that we're not talking about unravelling multiculturalism. We, we need to understand multiculturalism better, certainly. We need to have a much better understanding of multiculturalism than that given in the political speeches that talk of the death of multiculturalism, because that diversity is still here. That diversity doesn't go away. But the policies of how that diversity is made to work do matter. They, that needs to work effectively. When we have uh, election results that favour right-wing parties, alarm bells do need to go off because somehow the understanding, the experience, the, the working out of diversity somehow is not getting through to a substantial part of the population who have their own concerns and what those concerns may be. It be, may be because of economics, it may be because of identity, it may be because of another reason, a whole number of reasons, but those need to be understood in order that the, the wider project of living with diversity can be made more effective. This is, this is what multiculturalism is about, and my hope is that um, the, the political parties across Europe um, that are facing this diversity, um, whether that be Germany, France, the Netherlands, Scandinavia, or the UK, try to find ways in which the diversity can be integrated more into the national life, into uh, the, the, the national policy in many respects. Now, this might not necessarily mean a, a policy of multiculturalism, as is found in countries such as um, Canada or Australia, because such policies themselves can be quite tokenistic or quite weak in terms of their actual practicalities. But rather, there needs to be a more robust recognition or understanding uh, of the role of diversity within the national debate, um, moving beyond uh, conflicts between communities, conflicts between identities, very often boiling down to us and them, but to have a sense of a national identity that integrates, um, and here integration is important, that integrates all individuals within that national identity, whilst also recognising every single individual's uh, right to be different, however that might be, whether that's culturally, ethnically, religiously, or any in any other way. So long as people feel a sense of belonging and part of the national identity, then they, they, they should not be told what to wear, how to behave, what to believe in, or whatever it might be. There is a role uh, for such difference and the right, the respect for such difference, that not just toleration, but the right just simply to be different if one wishes to be um, of course you know so long as it doesn't uh, so long as there is um, uh, the rule of law so long as there is a respect for the rule of law um, that uh, each community each individual uh, can live with their difference just as the nation and the national identity can live with such differences